Welcome. Welcome. Close to another episode of the Profitable Property Management. Today we have Michael and Heather from RentBridge on. Guys, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Yeah, we're thanks for having Glad us. to be here. So, why are you in town? What's going on? Well, we're here for the uh, Texas uh, style NARPM convention. So, pretty excited to be here. We just drove down from Dallas. You're actually really here for the podcast episode, but you made oh, some time. <laughs> we're here for the podcast. <laughs> And it just so happens to be on the week. Yeah, we're thinking back, back two day conference on the backside. Yeah, yeah, they were they, they were really fortunate that they scheduled it on the same day. So <laughs> I, I like it. All right, so guys, give me some background about your work in the industry for those that don't know. I'll let you start. You start. Uh, well, um, in the industry itself, I started out um, coming out of law school, basically trying to figure out what I wanted to do, um, and I didn't. I knew I didn't want to be in trial law or do research or be in the basement doing, you know, in the book stacks. So um, came across a law firm that did uh, title closings in North Carolina. They have to be the largest one uh, in the state. So I joined them and uh, it was, it was a very different kind of law firm. We kind of call ourselves blue collar lawyers and we drove up and down the red dirt roads, closing refinance loans before the market collapsed. And um, as we did that, um, I ended up growing into a partnership role there, then spun off and had my law firm. Uh, fast forward a few years, I'm uh, running title companies in the mid-Atlantic and the real estate market crashes. And it literally, um, we would go every day and go see who was still open. And we'd go by a client and they would have 20 loan officers in there. You'd go by the next week and the lights were off, the chairs were on the tables and the computers were gone. This happened over and over again. So ended up reinventing myself um, and ended up um, building an investment management company, which I then sold in 2014 and came across a little, uh, figured, trying to figure out what I was going to do next, came across a little small little property management company called Renner's Warehouse and bought the rights in Dallas um, to build the franchise there. Uh, we built that, ended up selling it back in 2015, 2016, 2015, 2016, because we were open more than a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, because it was coming up on about a year and a half, we ended up doing the sale. Um, stayed on, ran that sales team there, and uh, then ended up uh, at an institutional while Heather started growing the consulting business. And now, um, for about a year, I've been on full time with the consulting firm um, in the marketing firm for a full year now. Heather had been already running that. So that's kind of my sort of all the way around about like a lot of people in real estate, we didn't really start out how we thought we'd end up. But uh, fortunately for us, uh, or fortunately for me, ended up loving what I do now. So it was a good, it was a good ride. Your turn. My ride was a little bit different. I studied rocks. <laughs> I was a petroleum geologist and had no interest in real estate whatsoever until I met Michael. And um, I was traveling a lot and was at home all that often and decided I needed a change. So I told Michael he needed me and I needed to come in and, and fix his infrastructure a little bit, which at that point I had no idea what that meant, but <laughs> I knew I could do it and I knew it was interesting to me. So um, I quit my job in, in oil and gas and came on as um, really just his, his number two at Renner's Warehouse. And to we be went fair, through. I told her I couldn't afford her. He did. <laughs> I, I, I thought we'd figure it out. We nice. Did. We ultimately did. <laughs> nice. Got it. So what specific part of ops were you involved in at Leonard's Warehouse? All of them. We we called it the, the, the fire fire person, the fire yeah. putter outer, so to speak. Chief fireman, basically. Um, so anything that was on fire, if the phone was ringing, and he had already put in or started to put into place um, some processes that we're going to eliminate some of the issues, but it was just a manpower issue at mm -hmm. that point. So yeah, it, anything and everything I could do to create a presence of calm and structure was, was my goal, which was hysterical to try to do <laughs> in, in property management. Nice. nice. So, so today you guys run an inbound marketing agency. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of the problems in the marketplace. I want to hear about some of the recurring problems that you guys see. I started off getting my bones selling started a company mm -hmm. called Management Property a long time ago. And that was kind of my first... I closed a few of those leads back in the day. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah you, were, you were a client. There you go. So we did that for a while. And what we found was what it's like for any SMB environment. Folks can't close leads. Therefore, they think the leads are bad. Can you find out they don't have a sales process? Mm -hmm. We built Lead Simple to help address the sales process. There's a lot of that really challenging scenario around a business that doesn't have enough ex <coughs> expertise to they handle, handle the sales marketing, marketing function well, which means they have a really negative orientation towards any form of lead gen. Mm -hmm. 
How do you guys interact with that as a marketing agency? You're not providing sales consulting, but that obviously needs to be there as a part of the equation. How do you walk people through that? And how do you qualify clients, just business owner, business owner for folks that you know you can lead gem for, but are not going to be able to close leads and are going to churn out 90 days? Yeah, yeah. So how we qualify, I'll answer that one first, is it's it's very clear up front whether or not the business owner themselves is invested in the process. Mm -hmm. And if it's clear to us that they're not, and they're hoping that we can come in and either handhold for a few months and make magic happen, or they want us to come in and be their business development person, that's that's obviously not going to be an ideal situation. Mm -hmm. um, we are an external third-party entity that's going to come in and teach to an extent the, the people that you have in place and help them improve on the existing processes that they have. But with inbound marketing, a lot of our strategy is equipping people to grow what we give them and partner with us. Partnering with us means you're invested and you're there all along the way. We're a, we're a done for you service. We do it all on our end. We don't require any input on the content creation or the development of the processes or anything like that. But then when we hand it to our clients, it is definitely a partnership. It's, it's a back and forth. It's a communication about how things are going and what the quality of the lead is and what you've done with it and whether or not that particular automation process is functioning properly for your business model. So identifying those that are willing to partner is really step one. Yeah. And I think with property management, your business development is uniquely, you know, I don't want to say it's different than other industries, but it has its own unique um, components to it. And one is you really have two different kinds of clients. So you have one who they're not really actively looking for a new property manager. They have some properties or a property that's being managed, and then they happen to come, a, come upon somebody who they want to give a shot, but there's not necessarily a need. Those are kind of a hard sell. Most of the time, property managers, it's a situational sale. Property's gone vacant, they're having an eviction they got to deal with, and they're tired of dealing with it. Something has triggered them that they are going to need a property manager. Um, so it's very situational. And what with a lot of the traditional marketing efforts, you're buying lead, buying lead, buying lead. Nothing wrong with that because those leads are usually triggered during that situation. But there's a whole group of those that when they make that initial or they start doing research, um, they may be months out. Uh, for making a decision. Yeah, so right. <clears throat> building what, you know, what we do as a marketing agencies, we're building an audience and we're building an expertise for a client. They're the expertise in the market so that when that lead comes around, it's time to actually take that action. They've been part of the audience for it might be six months, might be a year, might be a year and a half. And so that's kind of, kind of uniquely different than, you know, there's no, no, we, we don't have, we actually advocate using pay-per-click and using things like that when it's appropriate. Um, there's nothing wrong with those types of different types of lead generation, but what you want to do is you want to convert those rented leads into a captured audience that comes back over and over again. And that's kind of what I think is there's a lot of that lacking. Um, but you have a few guys out there doing it. Some of which are our clients that are building this content base where people mm -hmm. can come back over and over again. And then once they're ready, they can pull the trigger. So we're talking about the transition from prospect to lead mm -hmm. and back and forth, which happens, right? Yeah. Some of these qualified, but not yet yeah. ready to buy. They're a prospect. They're interested. Want to learn. Don't want to talk to you. Don't want to talk to a salesperson. This is what we all experience when we buy a car. A lot, I wait until the last possible second to interact with salespeople, but I'm doing plenty of research on my own. So let's talk about what does or doesn't work with the nuance of context. And lead nurturing would be one of those classic examples. Of like in theory, it sounds like a great idea, but is that a starting point? Is that a secondary thing? Like where would you rank that as a priority, given that it takes a fair bit of effort? relative to um, all the other things that you can be doing? Like, would you advocate you build out a lead nurturing program before they even have lead flow? Um, ideally, it's in place. Um, most of the time in reality, they don't have a lead nurturing program in place just because of resources and money and time to be able to set it up before they've had like on day one. Um, whenever we put an infrastructure in place, if they let's say we have a startup that they're working with, they haven't turned on the, they basically haven't opened their doors yet. We can get a pretty basic uh, lead nurturing campaign up and running. Um, I don't know. That's what's your answer. I, I, mine, your might be a little different. Um, mine is it's it's of the utmost priority. It's something that you need to have in place day one. It doesn't matter if you have no lead flow or just a little bit of lead flow. It's it's got to be there when your lead flow starts, and it's not a question of if that's going to start. It's when that starts. So trying to backtrack and put something in place as you're handling leads, particularly if you're a 
solo operation or if you're just a handful of people, Mm -hmm. having that lead nurturing platform and that, that process in place is extremely critical, mainly because if you're going backwards and trying to fulfill the needs as they they come along when you're also trying to close deals, those needs are not going to be met. So you're going to have a, a much higher drop off of people that you could have closed if you had just had, even, even if it's basic, I would mm-hmm. prefer that you put some actual time and effort into it, even if you're doing it on your own, right. but having something in place is critical. Well, on the kind of the technical detail side of this is you have to have, you've got to be collecting the right information from the get go or those leads will end up, they'll be okay, but you won't have the right information, especially when the way we build our marketing campaigns and platform is we can build and we build custom campaigns around investors, you know, small investors, large investors, the accidental landlord, the intentional landlord, and the messaging can be triggered very differently based on behavior, activity, what their, um, what their hot buttons are. Mm-hmm. So over a long period of time, if, you're targeting them a certain way because of the information you've gathered on the front end. Um, it's good, you're going to have a better conversion ratio down the road. Um, it, and if you wait a year or two or three years or five years before you do it, you have a lot of leads that you just don't have. You haven't captured the information in the right way um, or you have incomplete information. It's not that it's a waste. It's just that you can be so much more efficient in how you're targeting and developing that audience. <laughs> that, um, again, it's, it's all about quality and not quantity of, of, your leads and your interactions with them. Mm-hmm. And the way that we like to talk about it is, you know, lead nurturing and, and building an appropriate and effective content um, scenario is it's like raising a kid. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not that you, you can't have everything in place day one, but you're going to have to learn and grow with that growth, with that development. So if you put, you know, kindergarten level in place day one, okay, you've got something and you can build on that but you've got to learn from what happens and and grow and cultivate that into just the the beast that it ends up being if it's effective and if it's actually functioning for you. You want it to ultimately be your best salesperson. Well, you don't train your best salesperson overnight. It takes years. So starting with something is is definitely better than nothing. I think that's well said. So what I observe is that there's a lot of folks that have a very transactional relationship to growth. Like they want the outcome, but in terms of actually viewing the sales marketing function as being an extension of the service offering, there's a real disconnect there. Yeah. So I talk a lot about operationalizing sales marketing. And the first step there is just caring, like mm-hmm. actually believing that this is something that you're going to, it's an extension of your value to the selling process. And so lead nurturing is part of that, having education, transparency, the exercise of communicating your brand values that develops your ability to articulate and think about what you're doing beyond just being a glorified go which is kind of the baseline and default for any sort of space business is just a task oriented. And this is why you hear folks talking about, we do A, B, C, D, they do A, B, C, D, E, F, and it's different on these bases as opposed to story narrative values. That's the kind of defensible moat and competitive advantage. Do you guys do any brand identity work? How do you address that aspect of the client need? So it's actually the first thing that we do. Um, when we come in with a client kickoff call, that's that's the first topic that we cover is outlining what does our, what we call message mapping look like. And that's your brand story or your brand identity. So our team, um, the writers that are assigned to an individual account, plus our content strategist and myself come into every client kickoff call and we walk them through defining their individual buyer personas. A lot of property managers come in and say, you know, you do this for property managers. How do you not already know my buyer personas? Mm-hmm. Well, I do to an extent, Mm -hmm. but every single market and every single business is slightly nuanced. And those nuances are what's going to set you apart from the competition. And when you make the, have the property manager do it, there's some aha moments that they have. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're generally non-trivial aha moments where they realize there's an entire portion or entire concept of their business that they've either forgotten or discounted or didn't pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So going through this, this message mapping workshop, it, it takes place, uh, it starts on, on the kickoff call with us but then it takes place over the next two weeks with our entire team working on an individual account. So it's a very big piece of the puzzle for us because it informs every step of the way from that point forward. I think you made a really great point. So it's less about the archetype of the known categories or types of client accidentals versus investors and more about you as the business owner. What do you have moral conviction around that you can actually sell? Sales is about certainty, about the transference of belief. If you believe it strongly, 
somebody else will pick up on that. And if you don't, but you have a script and a dialogue and you got trained, that's going to be an uphill battle. So for the positioning, what would be some examples of some of the types of unique positioning you've seen companies actually have some success around? So one of our clients, um, I've, I've been really pleased with not only the success that he has, but just also the messaging around how he applies himself to the business. So they're out of Detroit and their, their tagline is street smart home wise. And I love that because it's him and, and really our team watched, and this is kind of just the peeling back the curtain <laughs> of our process. We stalked him online for weeks and weeks and weeks. And finally we stumbled across one video that he had put on YouTube that was him in a relaxed setting. It was, it was still a business video, but it was kind of one-on-one and just in a more relaxed setting. And it just revealed his personality to us. Our goal is to write every piece of content as if the business owner themselves had written it. Mm-hmm. The only way we're going to be able to do that is if we learn the business owner and their, 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 the way that they speak and the way that they think and the way that they feel about their own business, their mission, vision, and values. And in watching this video of him, you could just see everybody in the room finally just got it. And that's when we came up with Street Smart HomeWise. It's, we sell Detroit because we know Detroit. And the, you know they've lived there, they grew up there, they, they know everything about it, inner city and, and the, the Detroit metro area as well. So his, his overall Street Smart HomeWise is just him to a T. Yeah. And we've been able to then weave that through all of his other brand concepts. Like it. Yeah. I think another one would be uh, that we've seen a few times. And actually, we have a specific client out of California who um, very just loves the tech side of stuff. I mean, just likes anything that's innovative, especially in the industry. And he's really um, pushing to bring as much technology into his business to make it as efficient as possible. So as we went through that process with him, we ended up leaning his messaging into the technology, you know, how he's utilizing technology to be the state of the art property manager, to be, you know, that next evolution of what property management is. And so, and that was what made him tick. If we were for him, you know, doing other messaging that didn't really match his personality. It's not that we wouldn't get leads. It just wouldn't be this cohesive. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's yeah, totally you know. well said yeah. you can, the fake it to make it thing. Like yeah. there's a cost and there's a penalty. We're talking about small businesses. We're not talking about renters warehouse. We're not talking yeah. about TV and radio. We're talking about belly to belly sales. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Couldn't agree more. So for these small businesses, maybe let's just talk about the segments of types of businesses. You got folks on the really small low end. They're at a hundred doors or less. And it's a real kind of question mark of do they want to grow, grow above that? That's a really interesting segment because it's very much not clear that they're actually going to benefit from growth. It's not clear to me. I think in many cases, those folks that <clears throat> don't really want to hire, they got some margin right now. They're, um, they're not committed to the growth function. What is kind of the breaking point of where somebody needs to be at in terms of size and velocity for it to really make sense to actually aggressively grow, grow after growth? Because I know what you guys do isn't cheap. I mean, yeah. what, what client profile wise, where do you guys sit? So, and I'll, I'll let you um, give your input here as well, but the way that we look at it moving forward is coming into the scenario. If you, if you don't already know that you want to invest to the point of getting beyond that hundred door scale, then you're going to have a pretty hard time um, scaling to the point to be able to justify not only the tools that you need to do what we do, but also our services. So coming into it, that's one of the first questions. What is your end goal here? Do you want to be 100 doors, 200 doors, 500 doors? And then beyond that, it's looking at it from the perspective of, of are you trying to build a sellable asset mm-hmm. or are you trying to make a living? Mm-hmm. Because those are two different things. Mm-hmm. And if the answer is make a living, then let's give you the scaled down version of the full package and teach you how to run it yourself because you don't need full-blown services to be able to do that. If you're trying to build a sellable asset, let's do this. This is our, mm-hmm. our bread and butter. We can build this to help you sell it in the long term for a very large profit. Yeah, I think for, for us, it's less about the number of doors because like you said, velocity matters because if they're at 100, but their velocity is growing, they're probably someone that's investing in their business. Um, I think the two really big factors uh, for us are they are willing to make an investment in the business. Um, and they are willing to not only make that investment from a financial perspective, but from an effort and time and buy-in perspective. Um, we have a few that sometimes they'll make the financial uh, investment, but they are not willing to invest the time or it, it's not a lack of willing. They just, they're, they're busy. They've got other things going on, but they're not allocating the appropriate amount of time because this is a two-way street. 
we're, we're not somebody that you go in and you just, you know, throw a little bit of money at and we're just going to handle everything. You know, the clients need to be involved, or at least their team does, because yeah. we are, when, when you kind of look at how we grew out, of the, how our business grew out of this, we are, um, first and foremost, we started out as consultants about with property management. We've been in the business, we know how to run it. We, we went through the school of hard knocks. And so we, we understand the underpinning of the business. Um, and we can help, help to a certain extent, but we're not, you know, we need, we need you driving the bus in your office. You know, you need to get, you know, getting your team bought in. Mm -hmm. We can help with that, but there has to be dedication. And so it's both a financial and a, um, time commitment or at least a mental commitment. Yeah. I was gonna say mental commitments, probably, (laughs) you know, get your, your team bought in, you know, And, and again, it's, um, because the, what we want to do is transform your business. We're, we're not just somebody of, you know, send us whatever a month and we're just going to go play some ads or something like that. That's not, not a glorified awesome. APM. Yep. Yeah. Right. And we tell people we're part of, you, you know, you need to, from a budget standpoint, from a mental standpoint is we're part of your team now. Um, and we are helping build through our campaigns and through the marketing automation and a lot of that We're we are going to get you a, an employee built for you that's working 24 seven. But this is something that it takes time. And if you're going to do it right, it takes an investment. Then the clients that get that and they understand what we're doing and they see our processes um, and they are willing to, to jump in. That's, that's our ideal client. And size doesn't really make as much of a difference mm-hmm. as, um, you know, there's, I, I kind of joke on, on the consulting side. I like, I like two kinds of businesses. I like one to, ones that are just totally messed up and they're just like, break it all and rebuild it or once it's starting out, you know, those two are like, those are great. Um, but most are in the middle somewhere. Right. They're, they're like, I got some things that we can, you know, improve on mainly it's in marketing um, or it's, you know, I've, I've got a, issues with my turns or whatever. Well, when we look at everything, we look at it from both perspectives. We look at it from how we would approach from consulting, but it, property management as a whole, whole, we just look at it as the entire process, every department, everything involves marketing. It's all marketing because we are a relationship business, even though we're managing assets. All right, guys. So let's talk about this point around the sellable asset versus an income. I have some real mixed feelings around this. I have mixed feelings around the sellable asset concept in so much as that's kind of um, another way of saying the business doesn't make any money right now, yes. but, but we're going for sellable asset. But it doesn't make any money right now. It ain't gonna make yep. any money in the near term. You know that it gets real kind of muddy when you go into that because a sellable asset. What we're talking about here is the transference and going from selling contracts to selling a business. It's exciting. I'm all about it. You got to think about who's that acquire as you get larger, different flavor of acquire that would actually be qualified to purchase the business. Yep. But the underlying assumption is that the bigger that you get, the more you're trading on something closer to EBITDA. Exactly. And that means that if you have no profit, there ain't nothing to buy. Somebody's not going to pay you a large amount of money for an asset that kicks off very little profit. So when you think about this ideal and what it actually looks like day to day, how do you encourage folks to think about this in practice in a way that balances both asset value, but also the fiscal discipline requirement for profit? Oh man, I have a lot of thoughts on this too. <laughs> Let's hit it. Man. This, is a, this is a big one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's really big in the industry too. And you're exactly right. You're you're looking at trading contracts, so you've got to find some arbitrage between the price you pay and what you're going to sell it for. Once you have to actually be accountable for EBITDA, um, because you're going to have to have time in there to basically absorb the cost of that, get up to where now it is profitable, because you may not be profitable for two years if you're paying too much. Uh, maybe longer than that. It could be three or four years if you're paying way too much. Um, but then you have to have a period of time where you're profitable so that when you go to sell it, you actually have a sellable asset. Um, but the other side of the double-edged sword on that is, well, somebody looking at a flat growth for the last two years, right before you're going to sell, you know, it, it doesn't really bode well either. So um, you're, it, it is a very fine line to walk. Not to mention, you may pay a certain amount for a contract, but then when you calculate a churn, you calculate an overhead. It's mm-hmm. sometimes some doors are going to be net new, some are not. In terms of your um, your expense structure, I mean, it, it's a, it's a complicated um, calculation. I actually we do uh, one of the things I do sometimes is go in and do a 
um, contract analysis um, for somebody who's buying a property, you know, or a group of contracts. And I built, I literally basically went through and built an algorithm that basically said, okay, well, here are the revenue sources of the portfolio. Here's the assumed term rate. Here is um, what we're going to treat this as not new in terms of overhead, which is current profit margin. Um, so we're going to apply your current profit margin to that. And we're going to look at a bunch of different factors like geographic diversity. We're going to look at the rating of the portfolio. How hard is it going to manage? Um, what t- um, ownership diversity? How many owners are you? Are you, mm-hmm. you buying 500 contracts, but it's over 10 owners? That's a risky contract to buy. Um, all of those things, we plug. I plug it into this you know algorithm we built, and it spits out um, a weighted revenue number, which basically takes you know, your portfolio revenue over here, and it's going to overweight some of our recurring revenue and underweight transactional revenue. And if we have a kind of a you know a C minus to D portfolio we're buying, we're going to underweight that again a little bit, and so we're going to drive that around. And then we kind of then look at, all right, well, let's kind of apply the EBITDA concept to that and see. It doesn't really tell you what the way I built it is. It doesn't tell you what to pay because you can pay anything you want to. What it does say is, okay, based on your net, your your projected net, this is how much is how long it's going to take you to get your money back. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're if it's really, let's say you're buying ten contracts, that's going to probably be net new revenue. It is. You're, you still want to apply your overhead, but if you're buying hundred contracts, one hundred fifty, you're going to have additional overhead things like that. So we can adjust some of those based on that particular um, bucket that you're buying. But it tells you how long it's going to make you get your money back. You, we plug in, well, how are you going to pay for it? Do you have a clawback? Do you have uh, a way to recoup uh, near-term churn, things like that? Um, so the actual analysis that goes into it is pretty challenging. And when you're buying a portfolio, it's not like you're just, you're not buying a group of annuities. I mean, these are, these are clients who, you're not buying one contract, you're buying a contract, one to two owners, two to four tenants, mm-hmm. you're buying a lot for yeah. every contract you buy. Right. So you're going to apply all of that to that one contract price you're paying. Um, I, I think the prices got driven up for a while in property management. I think they got driven up probably too high, quite a bit too high. Um, I think that trend might be cooling a little bit now um, because it, I think it's been revealed that just going and just gobbling up as fast as you can is is a difficult business to do mm-hmm. um, unless you're paying roll up players yeah. yeah unless and, and people do it with the people who do it well there are some out there who do it well um, we we know a few of those that are doing a good job at that um, and they they have a good implementation plan um, and they are evaluating the portfolio in the right way and they're buying the right um, they're paying the right price and they have a system when they roll it up to how are you going to deal with those and deliver the same level of customer service that um, the, the little mom and pop did, and now you are a company that has 5,000 units or something. You're rolling in 100 into that 5,000. How are they going to feel like they're not in, you know, going to AT&T? Yeah. Now? So um, long-winded answer, but there's a lot. I mean, there really is a lot. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with acquisitions as a play. I think you just have to go very, very wide-eyed and realistic about what you're looking at and what you're doing. So my answer to that is more around the question of how big of a game can you play well? How much labor can you responsibly manage and still show profit for? And I think that's a different answer for every different entrepreneur. But to some degree, we're, we're talking, talking about the Peter Pistol, right? You're going to grow to the level of your incompetence. I think a lot of smaller operators are not well served by trying to grow aggressively. That person that had a really swank income and had a great lifestyle and then got kind of guilt tripped in this notion that they need to grow and have an asset. That's not always the right Right. play. There are other folks that are capable of doing that. I would have resistance around the idea that, well, if I grow, it's going to be hard and it's going to be unpleasant. That could be a story that is maybe hindering them from what would otherwise be a really profitable venture. I think it's definitely circumstantial in that regard, but specifically within the growth function, when we think about approaching this, there's so many different tactics, so many different directions. Let's walk through some of the classic categories of buckets of gen. You mentioned pay-per-click brand mm-hmm. gate. How do you guys relate to paid acquisition? You're an inbound agency, so I assume that's more of a minority of the use case of what you promote. It is, but that's it's not um, completely non-existent. We have clients that do actually focus a, a significant portion of their effort toward. Um, attracting 
potential acquisitions or even doing so through kind of an indirect approach through targeting um, real estate agents that have smaller portfolios and, and paying flat contract prices for those. So we do have people that will dedicate a certain portion of their effort in, in a specific inbound campaign toward acquiring other smaller property management companies. And in that respect, if the price is right and they're buying it from you know an individual owner that really just stumbled into a handful of doors and now realizes that they hate property management, that's generally a safer bet than it is for a small property management to go buy another small property management company and not necessarily have the infrastructure or the planning in place to implement that type of, of onboarding. Um, so we do have clients that, that take that approach and I'm, I'm in full support of that approach because they are able to grow in, in small leaps instead of you know one door or two doors at a time. Um, but as far as necessarily dedicating an entire campaign or entire amount of effort toward acquiring larger businesses. No, we don't have anybody right now doing that. And I don't necessarily advocate spending inbound efforts on that at, at this particular stage. So, so I was actually asking about um, paid acquisition on the Legion side, like pay-per-click. Okay. So as far as pay-per-click goes, we, we do, and I think Michael mentioned this earlier, we do see a lot of value in certain scenarios. So in the inbound, in the, the word is inboundy. It's not very inboundy to to pay for, <laughs> yeah. for leads. However, um, so, so as a whole, we, we don't we don't necessarily subscribe to that. But there are certain scenarios where, particularly in the beginning, where you've got to get the wheel spinning. And if we're if we're going to do a true inbound methodology, then that wheel is going to take six to nine months to start spinning. If you want to add, you know, a little bit of grease to the wheel in the very beginning, that's great. Let's do that. Let's get the wheel spinning a little bit faster, and we can then turn what we call rented leads, which is what we think of as paid ads, paid mm, leads. Rented channel. Exactly. So you're, you're building this audience, but as soon as you stop paying that audience, that audience goes away. So if there's an inbound methodology in place to capture those paid leads and turn them into an owned audience, then that's ideal. But long-term, our goal is to either mitigate the amount of paid lead or paid spend that you're you're spending on a monthly basis or eliminate it altogether if we can. In most scenarios, we can eliminate it altogether. So it's not that we don't promote or, or subscribe to the concept of, of paid leads. We just don't see it as a long-term scalable effort. And it's not something I want people necessarily depending on. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you are going to cap out and there's going to be that critical mass or that um, inflection point where the cost of your lead and your cost of acquisition or, you know, in terms of your sale, um, it, it's, you know, it'd be, it's not really worth it to spend the next dollar. Um, you know, in any given market, you're going to max out on really what it makes sense to, in, especially in property management. I mean, yeah, it's a big market that you're going after, but at some point you're going to max out on the effectiveness of those dollars and it's going to go away. Um, and I've always looked at it as you have all these different methods that we do business development in property management. It's going to investor groups, it's pressing the flash. Some people do mailers, some people do, other types of things that, um, you know, they might uh, hold seminars, things like that. Well, it's what you do with those after, whether it's mm -hmm. pay-per-click. I mean, and all those to an extent, many of those are paid efforts. You're paying membership fees, you're Labor. putting on a seminar, you're putting on, you know, there's cost to everything. Sometimes it's more than others. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times we had a little pizza thing where we ordered pizza and have people come in and it's like, oh, great, I bought 20 pizzas for two people to show up. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, that was a, that cost for acquisition was, you know, so, um, you know, but it is what you do kind of after that. If, if Because even if you go into somewhere, you're like, ah, geez, you know, I just spent like $200 for that lead. And that's not ideal for that particular lead. However, I can convert them over into my earned audience or my captive audience or just a permanent audience that eventually they do convert then at least I'm going to basically take that lead that would probably maybe have been lost. You know, they came or you acquired it for some, let's say you acquired it for $200. And it's, a, it's your price per, on that lead is quite a bit. And sometimes you know, under most cases, follow-ups kind of the worst with, you know, in any industry, that's the hard part. Um, but not only follow-up, but it, an actual follow-up where it's content-based to where it's useful information that they're getting. It's educational information, yeah. which really is, the most important yeah. component of, of yeah. our follow-up campaigns or anything that we design for people is if it's not continuing to inform and continuing to educate and continuing to offer value, then why are you following up with them? Yeah. Sending an email that says, hey, I just wanted to check in and see if you want to buy yeah. from me yet. We get a ton of those. Yeah. It's, that, that's not a, a true follow-up sequence. That's an annoyance most of the time. Mm -hmm. So well, continuing that offer of, of 
yeah. educational content is really critical. Yeah, and it's this cascading effect. So that two hundred dollar lead, he becomes part of the audience um, and receiving educational information, stuff like that. That guy may never become uh, or cow may never become a client, but they might know somebody. They might refer and say, "Hey, you know, I follow this. I follow this. Yeah, I follow that." Right. People most likely aren't going to do that with email drips, and, and we do email drips. By the way, that's an important part of it. But if it's somebody that they're following based on educational content, that feeds the other kinds of things like referrals that you want. So it's not one or the other. I mean, this is a, it's kind of a full ecosystem, but I always look at the inbound thing is that's kind of our umbrella uh, for everything. So when you say email drips, it's not about the medium of email that you're commenting on, but the actual content that's going in the email. Is it, Hey, are you ready? Or is it a, you know, 10 steps to investing in real estate? Yeah. I think, I think doing an email drip is awesome and great and staying in front of people. I think that's part, it's a critical part. It's, it's necessary and critical. It's combining that with quality of content. Mm -hmm. Um, That's where it becomes effective. Um, You know, if it's, if, you know, and and I'm kind of talking in the marketing phase before you're actually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the point here. There's like, there's so much nuance in this game. Yeah. It's stage appropriate. We're talking MQL, SQL. If somebody ponied up and you had a sit and you had that sales conversation, you got permission to follow up. Absolutely. In a, in a one-on-one transactional way. Yeah. And I want to yeah make sure I qualified that when all of that is marketing, you know, when you're marketing qualified mm-hmm. prior to saying, let's sit down, let's talk right. about a bit of the form or whatever it is. We're, we're building that. Um, we're building them up to that point. Right. We want to improve the quality and the amount of those that get to that point. And then absolutely. I think the automation behind post, they become a, a qualified lead that a self qualified lead um, I think you're crazy not to have automated follow up behind that mm-hmm. in terms of that, because yes, one, you have permission to, you have to, or you're just, yeah. you're burning money left and right. In the right cadence and the mm-hmm. right volume and the right context. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So what keeps coming up here is that it's a long relational game and it's really hard to escape the implications of your values and your, your culture as being a manifestation of how you prioritize is it transactional or is it relational? Yeah. If it's relational, you're creating the content because it's useful. It's helpful. It's what you do. It's part of your core mission is to help your customers both before the sale, during the sale, and after the sale. Even when they exit, they want to go somewhere else. Yeah. That orientation, I think, is the bigger picture conversation that needs to be had, or at least is had for the folks that have the greatest level of success. Once that mindset shift has happened, there's less pushback on, well, Boy, that sounds like a lot of work. That sounds really hard. I was like, well, yeah, it, it is. There's no question yeah. about that. But this is a defensible strategy. Yeah. This is a moat. Either it's commodity A, commodity B, and you're incrementally better, or you're fundamentally in a different category because yeah. it's there's a story like wealth creation through real estate versus you know the name property management. What does it imply? It implies that my primarily primary task is preventing something bad from happening. Yeah. Like very reactive, yeah. very commodified. Yeah. So would you agree that in terms of paradigm shift, that that's really the key Absolutely. mindset to adopt? Yeah. So our, our goal going in is to create a culture in, in the office of our clients. So it's not just, you know, we bought in, our team has bought in, we're going to sell you and, and get you to buy in. But at the end of that phone call, if that's the last thing that happens, no, nothing else is going to happen. You've got to then go back to your office or allow us to build into your team like we plan to. And, and build this culture and create this culture of this is what we do. We serve our clients mm-hmm. with this mission, vision, and values. And we do it through every step of the process, be it an email or a text message or a letter that goes out or following up and being proactive instead of reactive with mm-hmm. something that we know tenants are going to do wrong mm-hmm. and, and things along those lines. So just creating that culture of this is how we do things is, is really all that matters. That's the most important thing that we need to convey to our clients coming in because if they don't and they just expect us to produce leads, we're going to produce some pretty pricey leads for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's that that's that can't be where it ends or this isn't an effective process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really in in the paradigm shift in that there the thinking of that is also just time frame. And when we understand it, when you're in property management, it's Doors under management, doors under management, doors under management. How many leads am I getting? How many am I closing? Revenue. Out? Yep. All because yeah, you're you're trying to convert that into revenue dollars as fast as possible. And the paradigm shift is okay. This is the long term play. Yes, I'm continuing to do these things, but we're also looking at the long term play that you've got to have the commitment to kind of 
get through that period. One, it's an investment. Absolutely, it takes an investment. It takes investment in the, the platform. It takes investment in us. It takes a, a long-term investment, but it does pay off down the road. But if you go in and you're 60 days in and you're like, how many leads have I gotten and what's my price per lead? You're talking to the wrong person. If we're looking at how has your business changed over the course of a year, year and a half, two years, it can transform completely operationally. It can transform marketing. It, your sales can transform. All of it can, but it doesn't happen overnight. And one of the things we caution with our clients is, listen, you're going to get in 60 days, 90 days, and we've been having a lot of conversations and calls. And you're like, what's happening? I don't really, you know, it's it's the duck on the water. All the wheels are all the, the, the you know, paddling underneath the water really, really fast but it doesn't really look like much is happening until you start getting around six months, nine months, and then it all starts kind of kicking in. And yeah, that's been an investment to get there, but it's an investment that stays. You own it. It's always there. And that is, that's the other thing. You got to get to the paradigm shift of, I'm not just looking at tomorrow. I'm looking at next year, the year after the year after. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, we're not the right answer for everybody. We're not. Um, And neither is inbound. Inbound is not the right answer. Right. Yeah. Better way to put everyone. It. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the dynamics that cause people to maybe not be as open to thinking about investing in sales and marketing. I think part of that is just acknowledging, in many ways, the jaded nature of property management, particularly thinking about tenants, stress, and there's kind of like this. Um, you guys have probably seen that social science study that was done years ago. It was like a prisoner experiment. You take two groups of people and then you tell one group of people that they're the guards and the other groups that they're the prisoners and you can switch it. And it doesn't matter who's in what group or the temperamental <laughs> background. Just by, by putting those titles, yeah. the, the guards <laughs> to kind of really want to police people and the prisoners are really <laughs> resentful. <laughs> Some of this is kind of present in the landlord-tenant relationship and that getting beat up and dealing with complaints do you feel like that that's part of what causes people to maybe not be as um, excited about like really leaning into education and sunshine and smiles and rainbows? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that absolutely plays a part into <laughs> just the overall mentality of property management. And, you know, we know going in. And by the way, that's why we do video calls. So we can see it on their face. <laughs> <laughs> we want to see their face. When we first talk with them, they feel like, we can see. They're like everything's great. Everything's just great. No, it's not. I can just. Or you'll Sorry. say something about tenant education, and somebody in the background will go like this. Uh-huh. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Right. But now, I mean, we we know. I mean, even on one of our our pillar pages, it says, you know, you're working fifty to sixty hour work weeks. We know that your life is exhausting. It doesn't have to be this way. So we we know the mentality of property management as a whole, and we know that having been there, your phone never stops ringing. You're, you're, it's never ringing for a good reason either. It's always some negative on the other end mm-hmm. if you're running like a traditional property management company. So going into it, we do try and paint the picture of there is a better way and there is another option, but you still have to get over the, the concept of just because it's been the way that it's been doesn't mean that it's always going to be that way. And frankly, just because parts of it are working doesn't mean that that's the way that you should do it. Mm-hmm. There are all, there, there are alternate options that you can take almost every at every turn. You can look at it from the perspective of every piece of our business is is going to be built to serve others, to mm-hmm. serve our yeah. owners, to serve our clients, right. to serve the real estate industry, to serve our families, to serve as a long term solution for everyone involved. And if you if you take that approach and you look at it from that perspective, that you really can build something of value that is offering value to yourself and your clients, then everything that you put into it is going to see a return. It's not just writing an email for a tenant to learn how to recode their garage door opener. Who cares? They can look that up on on Google. But if they don't have to, and you know that this person is over 80 and has never had a a, a remote before for their garage door, then why not proactively send that out and and let... Mail it instead of email it, and just let them know that you're you're considering them as a human, mm-hmm. and and taking this human approach to not just making money, which is a way more rewarding way to be running the business right. in the first place. And I think that that's a really optimistic view that can be paired with the fact that property management sits at the hub of a bunch of related businesses and opportunities. Mm-hmm. What's exciting to me about growth is being able to operate out of an abundance mindset and a scarcity mindset versus a scarcity mindset. What I mean by that is when you got leads coming through, you don't have to wear yourself out to that client. You knew 
out of the gate was going to mistreat you. Uh, yeah, we've all done it. Yeah. So it's in there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't, I'm not going to sit here like I have the answer to not do that when you're starting in zero doors. But you get to a certain point of age or scale, self respect, whatever needs to happen to you on your journey where you want to stop doing that, you still either you're going to shrink because you're going to fire some clients and that's okay. In many cases, that's actually a good thing. That's oftentimes in profit coach, what we do is slough off the bottom 10%. But the growth conversation doesn't have to be about growing the absolute revenue numbers. It can be about revenue going sideways, Mm -hmm. but radically improving the quality of your portfolio, driving profit. Do you feel like people always come in wanting to increase top line revenue or do some clients ever have that vision for churning out those, those crappy clients and trading them for better ones. So two different ways, um, probably that clients really come to us. They either like, I just want to grow, grow, grow. And that's going to help, you know, I'm going to add doors, add revenue, then I can add more infrastructure, add more people. Um, the other ones that come to us, they come to us on the other side and says, I need you to help fix my business first. Then let's get into marketing. And um, for us, it's kind of, it goes all together. I mean, one of the reasons we utilize the platform we do is we do weave marketing throughout. So what we try to do is create as much of, um, you know, automated communication is possible throughout the entire tenant life. Whether it's like you said, like um, somebody is having trouble programming the garage door opener. Well, if they submit it, something online, it automatically triggers out an instruction to them or they have a health, self-help thing or a video goes out um, or through the move-in process, um, we trigger out a video email that the tenant has to watch first before getting their keys and we can track whether they watched it or not. And it tells them, here's how you take care of your property. Here's how you change your filters. Here's, you know, the, you know just the basics of being a renter. Um, or an automated video when they move out. Uh, here's how we want you to keep your property. Here's what we're going to be charged for. Here's not. We're going to show you an example here. And everything's through video and automated communication. What we try to do is take all of those um, types of communication. And if we can automate those, then we can focus on the areas where we need to have a human talking. And oddly enough, even though all of those things are automated, if it's done right, it feels more personal because when it really matters, they're talking to a human. Because right now, property management, if you're operating in kind of the traditional way, phone call, phone call, phone call, email, 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 and you don't have time to address the ones that are really important. But if I can get as much of the communication standardized, but feel really good and be high quality in terms of even just the things they need to know while being a tenant, then, and same thing for owners, mm-hmm. you know, same thing on both sides of this, that then when I need the people who really need that personal human to talk to, they can. Um, what you don't want it to feel like, though, is when you call into a call center and you're like, I can't get through this stupid phone tree. Mm-hmm. You don't want it to be that, but you want that good mix of, okay, I got plenty of self-help thing. Now I need to go to the next step. And I think we're seeing a lot of success with that. Um, you know, we have some clients doing some great videos and, We're building automated triggers based on tenant behavioral activity so that they don't have to answer the same question over and over and over again. Um, And the tenants like it. They're like, well, okay, well, that was easy. I didn't have to wait to get someone to call me back or email to get an answer like that. Um, So that kind of getting all the way back to answering your question is that when they come to us for that in terms of growth, that's part of it. Because if you grow, but you can't scale because that communications inside of your automation isn't there, then all you're doing is you're like, I'm adding doors, but I'm throwing people at it and nothing is changing. My phone's still blowing up. They're, everybody's still stressed out. You know, it, it, nothing has changed. I just have more doors now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Maybe I can sell it. You know, and so that's, you know, it's really, you have to look at it both ways. Yeah, you make a good point. A lot of times the exit conversation is less around the strategic outcome mm-hmm. and it's more just like, I'm burnt out. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. what, where's the, where are the exit doors here? Yeah, you see two different. They're definitely if someone was solely focused on that on the on the sell game, or someone who's like, I might sell, or I'm just going to just build this maybe pass to my kids. These two mindsets are similar. The I might sell, but I'm you know I'm going to be in it for a while, or I might just keep it forever. Then you look at the ones who are just going to buy and I just want to turn and sell. They, I don't want to say it's universally, but the. Owners and the tenants on those two different ones are going to have vastly different experiences <laughs> in terms of their yeah. interaction with the property. The NPS score is going to look a lot different. Yeah. I, I get yeah. that. So velocity of communications at some point is so overwhelming that you cannot prioritize. And I experienced that. I'm one of the guys that does inbox zero. And there are times where it's like, okay, am I just being a whack-a-mole errand boy? Just like just trying to click through them all. 
Or am I creating, am I doing what I want to be doing, which is create enough space that I can actually prioritize and proactively choose what I want for the business? Because the reality is, as business owners, nobody else is looking out for the big picture strategic outcomes. Those small, that 20% of activities that drive 80% of the outcome, there's nobody inside or outside that's, that the business that is going to do that other than you and you have to create space for the thought. But when we talk about busyness, VAs enter the conversation around how to get more efficient. And typically that's on the ops side, Mm. but we're seeing a little bit of a pickup with some folks plugging some of that in on the sales and marketing side as well. Have you seen any folks successfully deploy either remote or a True VA. And the distinction I made there is a remote member is just somebody that's not in your city. A VA is really lower level labor that is more task oriented as opposed to being relationally oriented. Have you seen any folks use any of these categories of labor within the sales and marketing function? Yes, we have. So we've seen a lot of the remote labor option. It, it dramatically increases your talent pool. If you live in a state where that person doesn't necessarily have to be um, a licensed real estate agent to be a true business development person in NPM then that obviously opens your doors even further. But as far as um, VAs, we've seen that as well. Um, it, it appears that the line is drawn simply at having the conversation. So they're able to automate as much of that process as they can and have u- utilizing tools like playbooks and having the, the online conversation feel like a much more fluid conversation with a real person that has a standardized playbook of information that they can feed back and forth. So it's not necessarily just a, a computerized or, or robotic chatbot that you're, you're talking to. It's actually a person on the other end of that chatbot that's, that's got a, a deck of information that's approved by the property manager that they can answer questions with. And it's usually just frequently asked questions. But then at the end of that transaction, that person is then allowed to schedule a live um, interaction with either the business development person in the office or if they have a sales manager or something along those lines. But they can choose from the, the calendar right then and there to choose a time to talk further. Um, so it's it's portraying that they are the either the salesperson themselves or the PD or sometimes even the business owner um, up to the point of needing to have that live conversation. So then the BD can step in, review the conversation because it's all there in text and just pick it up and keep going. Got it. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm digging it. You got more on this? Yeah, you know, BAs are such a, they've just become such a hot topic this year in the last, you know, 12, 18. I mean, they, they have been for a while, but specifically this year, we've just seen a lot of questions about a lot of conversations. And my general thought with VAs is, you know, high repetitive, low touch tasks. Basically, um, you're not dealing so much with the external public with your typical type of VA. They're doing administrative tasks, things like that. Well, when you look at it from a sales perspective, um, Heather was very much right. One of the biggest hurdles you have is there's a segment with most states where they just can't do it. They're not licensed salespeople. They can't, they can't call, call. they can't um, have very specific conversations at all about information. I mean, in some states are really strict and some, some are not. So there's a whole area that they just can't do. But when you're looking through pulling through data, pulling, putting together lists, um, maybe wants somebody to sign, going through and QCing, um, management agreements and all that kind of stuff. They can be very, um, useful in that process. Um, it's just knowing that, making sure that the, the from a legal standpoint that you don't cross that line. That's always kind of been my concern, and I think that's probably you know maybe that's just legal background here. That maybe that's <laughs> that, that, that. And so, um, but as long as you're careful, with it, I think VAs are great. Um, and again, I, I I kind of have a mixed emotions and, and thoughts on it. I think there's sometimes they work out great, sometimes they don't. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've seen them go both ways. Just, you just gotta be careful when you're betting them and give them a trial. Let's talk about another use case and kind of go, go into the whole subject of outbound. You're an inbound agency. That's exciting. I'm a believer. I'm a believer in inbound because I think it's good business. I think it's good business to do like what we're doing right right now. You You know what I could do, but what I don't do is count how many sales qualified leads come off the podcast. Mm -hmm. It's cool. It's interesting, but in some ways, I don't really care. I'm in this for the long game. I'm here to add value. Outbound has a very different flavor. Outbound is how many leads, counting the money. Like it's it's surgical with outbound. Yeah. The good, the nature of the goodwill that you're creating is very different than inbound. Do you guys have any experience with clients that have ramped programs around realtor outreach, calling furbos? Any experience in that area? Yeah, quite a bit actually. So um, outbound, and, and we cover this, you know, pretty early on with our clients. Outbound is a part of our inbound methodology. It's both woven um, intermittently throughout the process, but it's also a separate segment all by itself. So 
We have clients that will do strict outbound campaigns to real estate agents. We also have clients that will do strict outbound campaigns to absentee owners based on tax lists, um, both of which have you know extremely low conversion rates, but they mm-hmm. have conversion rates. So as long as you're not you know investing too terribly much uh, of your time or, or resources into that, then obviously that's something that we can definitely weave into the inbound methodology. But what we like about outbound is having it as a part of inbound, meaning if we have you know somebody that comes to the website and maybe even doesn't submit a form, but maybe is viewing a certain page for an extended period of time, or they come back for a third time to look at the same property, or and this is both on those that have a sales brokerage as well as a PM, or they come and they you, you have your management agreement online and they've looked at that management agreement five or six times. Go ahead and send them a physical letter. Do some outbound outreach there that, that's a, almost like a direct mail um, type of approach there that you're, you're making not just a follow-up effort, but a directed outbound effort that was not necessarily solicited because they didn't put in a form or request more information. So that's how we take um, an outbound, outbound approach inside of our, our traditional inbound methodology. Yeah, you know, and one of the, and again, one of the things that we kind of caution or even are very much aware of is when we are tracking everything. So we see the first time somebody comes and they're like, okay, well, they came through a paid ad. And then later they get converted. Well, it's going to show that that was the source, but they were converted and they may have spent and become part of this permanent audience. But the credit is going to go to that campaign that originally got them to the website or whatever it is, um, which is great. So the inbound supports the outbound. Um, What we like to see is not only bring in our own fresh inbound leads, but we also want to see the outbound efforts increase in terms of their conversion ratios. Yeah, multi-hedge attribution is really complicated, but do you think that is how it should be, is giving credit to the first touch as opposed to a portion based on how much of the funnel they touched? That's a good question. I firmly believe it's apportionment. I I believe that every activity that took place between the time they landed to the time they left had something to do with the conversion because you see people with paid ads that they get these leads coming in. You can, and we can see that they come to the website, they leave, and sometimes they never come back. But if you're dripping on them or if you're serving them additional content that's pertinent to what they were originally searching. Mm -hmm. And that's really one of the caveats that we put into our paid ads is we don't just want to know that they came from the paid ad. We want to know the search term that they used to to be Mm -hmm. served that paid ad so that we can cultivate the information that we're going to send back out to them Mm -hmm. based on the original search term, not just based on the fact that they landed on a property management ad for your city. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a discovery phase there as to honing in what we're going to send back out. I love the example you brought up though, because behavioral based triggers is really where a lot of magic happens. I'm a part of a program called strategic coach. My first interaction was probably me downloading an Mm ebook. At some point I got a personal introduction. So then I had a rep. She's contacting me. I'm ignoring classic sales. I'm just I'm too early in the cycle for that. Yeah. But at some point, I kept listening to the podcast that this guy runs, mm-hmm. and I went back to a page that was deep enough in the funnel. It was like details for signing mm-hmm. up, and I'm on the website, and I get a call. Yeah, and it's like one of those. They must be using the spot. <laughs> they're, 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 they're using part out, but it's one okay. of those situations. Like you know, was that a, was that a coincidence? No, it wasn't a coincidence. They got an alert. They touched me and it worked because I'm right there. I'm thinking about it. I'm in context, thinking about the details. I have some questions. That's what takes traditional marketing from here and takes you way over here to that effectiveness because it's exactly a property management. You find them on, they come back the third time to the management fee pricing page and they're looking through that. And maybe two weeks ago, they downloaded the landlord guy, you know, how to be a good landlord guide or um, whatever it is, or, you know, you can track all that. And the trigger there is, well, maybe we send them a physical mailer piece. We trigger that automatically or we or text tr- message or, or whatever. We send text, Something else. Yeah. We create an alert to our the BDM person to call them, you know, same exactly like you said, I mean, you're on the page and it can be done. There are thousands of triggers that can be set up. I mean, literally thousands of different things and actions and behaviors that can cause that. And that creates an alert. Hey, you need to call so-and-so. They're back on the website looking at this page. Um, and it's great. Or you can, maybe they're looking at the eviction page and you send them a video, a text link to a video that talks about, here's how we handle evictions and put a good tenant in the property. Mm-hmm. You can be very, very focused. Surgical. Yeah. It's, now, we, it's, that doesn't happen out of the gate. 
Allegate, we're basically putting in the fundamental building blocks. And then as you build it, this is, it's... That's the teenage version of inbound marketing. Like inbound marketing, when you start as a kindergartner, and then by the time you've added in all of the layers and all of your your expertise and and the ability to hone in everything and tweak and change and A-B test along the way, by the time you get to, you know, the teenage version of your inbound marketing campaigns, they're relatively sophisticated. They they can think and kind of perform on their own, but you still want to be paying attention and, and making tweaks and changes based on, on your results for that given campaign. Yeah. You're talking about optimization. Mm-hmm. If you have an elite flow, there's nothing yeah. to optimize off exactly. of. So it's a lot of consideration. Yeah. For those folks that are kind of on the fence with growth, they're attracted, they listen to the podcast, maybe they went to PM Grow. They're very curious, but they're not quite sure if they're ready to make the commitment. What advice or do you f- feedback would you have to help them kind of clarify whether or not the timing is actually right and they're going to get the outcome that they want from going down that path? So the first thing that I tell people is if you're at the point that you could make your next hire, but you're not entirely sure where that next hire should go. Should that next hire be in marketing? Should that next hire be a a BD person? Should that next hire be another property manager? If you're in that stage where you're looking to make your next hire, or you already realize that in order for you to grow, you're going to have to make another hire, call us. Call us. Let's have a conversation. Or start looking into inbound for yourself because that next hire could manage your inbound for you. But having that, that desire and that ability and that opportunity to take a next step. It doesn't have to be this next step, but a next step is when you're already in the right mind frame and you already have established the fact that the opportunity for growth is there. So that's one of the first questions that we ask, but what's your thought on yeah, that? Yeah. My kind of broader thought is property management is one of these businesses you're in or you're out <laughs> you're just in terms of how fast you grow. Um, or if you kind of want to level out, that's, that's another question. But um, the, at, at some point you you have to decide I'm in it. And it doesn't mean that I have to grow to 2,000 doors, but I am in it. I have got a legitimate business and we're going to grow it to the point that it is a business. At that point, you've made the decision and now you need to start laying out your plan of how am I going to do that? And, and again, that's kind of where guys like you come in, guys like us come in. We, you know, we help people get to that next step and figure out, well, how am I going to grow? How fast do I need to grow? How am I going to operationally do this? Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of my biggest thing is, it, you know, a lot can be accomplished if you just make a decision and you make a commitment. <laughs> so being on the fence is really just getting, getting the person off the fence is probably step number one. Yeah. And we do have um, kind of a platform that will let people decide whether or not they want to get off the fence. And we call it our game plan. It's free. It's on the website. It's easy to follow. And it will answer the questions for you as to whether or not, do you want to do this to yourself? Do you want to do this at all? Is the first question. Do you want to do this yourself? Do you want to hire somebody to do this? Do you want to hire that person internally? Do you want to hire that person externally? It will answer all of those questions for you in an extremely methodical fashion. It's literally an example of what we do for our clients. And it's step by step how we go through our processes. So starting with that game plan and approaching, we actually have um, free game plans we'll, we'll be handing out at NARPM this week too. But uh, starting with that game plan and just downloading that, taking a look at it and, and trying to decide, do I even have any desire to do this? Do I even have any desire to transform my business in this way? If the, that answer is yes, then the only, only question left is, do I want to do it myself or do I need help? And that's, that should be a pretty easy answer. I love that. Yeah, it's a great answer. I love the fact that you guys are focused on the whole life cycle of the business. My whole thing is if you're going to go in with an agency, you have to be willing to partner and they have to be capable of partnering or it's a transactional relationship. Exactly. That's what APM is. It's not bad. It's not wrong. It's just different, you know? And if you know what you're doing there, it's great. There's a small number of people using all property management that are closing the bulk of the leads. Yep. And then you get all the losers that are churning out and are subsidizing the cost of the entire program. Yeah. That's the practical reality. It's not pleasant unless you're one of the closers. Yep. But it, I actually built probably the first out of the 100. I probably, 60 of them probably came from APM. I'd pick up the phone and call myself. Yeah, and, and that can work. If it's, you, it's hard though. It's Jerry McGuire time. I mean, you're everybody's like... A hundred percent. I had Brent Hayden on the podcast maybe three months ago. And the one thing that he said with more conviction than anything was in his mind's eye transferring back to what used to get him pissed off in the business. And it was people not, it was hearing the phone, the sales lead phone ring until it went to voicemail. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was like the one thing that I guess still was like triggering him as we're like having this interview. Yeah. <laughs> it's a totally different game for sure. But I like that you're addressing the goals to holistic life cycle and that you're capable of doing that. You have operational chops. So the last thing that I'm thinking of here is 
in terms of that holistic cycle, finance is a part of it. We're really excited about the NARM from accounting standard. We're rolling that out in about 28 days from now. To me, this represents part of the future of the industry, which is having a bigger view of what is going on, being able to talk about money, business, entrepreneurship, realize this is, this is an asset. This is one way to make a buck. There's thousands and thousands of others making a relative comparison on how this business will make you money as opposed to investing in a CD or doing anything else. A real dollar to dollar comparison, I think, is a big part of how the industry can grow where do you guys see a shift happening in the industry? What do you think the future looks like? Yeah, it, it has to um, it has to have some level of standard. And being on our the consulting side of our business, it's the wild west still, even today. Um, it you see everything from the brokerage and PM businesses mixed with mixed books, and they have no idea what they're making on either side of the business. Like I, I think we're making two hundred grand a year. Okay, well, show me your p and I really can't because it's mixed with everything else. I see that. Um, we see very me- sometimes very messy p and We see um, some companies will do all of their accounting inside of, uh, you know, at Folio Propertyware, which is fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, but there's no, one of the things that we look at, there's no standard way. And I don't think that you, you want a standard way that everybody does every single thing, names every single fee, because it's just, yeah. I think that's a little, you know, where everything is so, so standard. But you need like these guiding principles so that Mm -hmm. you know, where am I in terms of the benchmark here? Am I just floundering or am I actually performing that fairly well? Right. What we find is probably as you have found, most are not really excelling and operating at a very high um, financial efficiency um, because, you know, again, we start digging in and it's a lot of them just don't know they're, you know, they're making maybe a little money or not. And, they think they're doing okay, but they don't know why. And so I do think the industry is maturing. It's changing. I think it's a good thing. Um, so I, don't know, I'm, I think the next few years are going to um, bring a little bit more organization to the business. So you're on the op side within the business. You're on the growth side. Do you feel that the growth picture is really enabled or clarified when you have clarity on the, the financial operational side of things? Absolutely, unequivocally. So if, if someone has a target in mind. They need to close as a BD person. They need to close 10 new doors a month. What does that mean? Yes, that's a quantity. They can close 10 doors or they can close 10 contracts. But if they have no idea that they're also losing 25, Mm -hmm. then you've got this churn concept that doesn't doesn't transfer across from the ops side to the sales side or to the the BD side. And having that person be more than just a, a salesperson, more than just a business development person, but having them be your PR person, your marketing person, your ha- having a, at least a finger on the pulse of customer service so that they know that what they're selling is being fulfilled and, and transferring all of this closed doors, closed doors, closed doors to let's provide value and let's provide a service and let's all have one brand identity that we're all fulfilling together mm-hmm. as a company is really where, mm-hmm. where I see the most success come from our, our clients. Dude, I'm digging what you're saying. I think that parlays into maybe the most exciting aspect of growth is people having a team careers, mm-hmm. having other people that can grow up and there's a ladder to climb. Like, like, if it's a three wrong ladder, the business has to grow yeah. for you to have the type of employee and team member that wants to grow. And those are the most exciting people to work with by far. Yeah. One of my, um, I won't give too many details because I don't know if this person, <laughs> I don't really have permission to use names or I haven't asked, but it was somebody that came to work for us and had, you know, never made more than probably $30,000 a year and kind of in a pretty physical job and it's kind of gotten tired of it. And within a year, year and a half had become a six figure earner mm-hmm. and being very successful and seeing that, you know, seeing that person's life change. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've seen that happen over and over again where somebody comes in with a, really basic skill set. And now, you know, I would consider them a quasi expert in this particular area and they're very marketable. They're making good money and they have, um, you know, a really nice future. And I, I love seeing that. And what our business, what's fun about our business now is we used to do that in our own business. We'd get excited about what's happening in our own business. Well, now we have a few dozen clients that we get to get excited about. So-and-so got promoted or so-and-so is now in charge of this. So now we get a share in all of that excitement with, a whole lot of companies and all the really cool things. And um, somebody will tell us a business model or something they're about to do. We'll get 
I'll go into Heather's office. I'll be like, okay, someone's was about to do this. I'm so excited. We got to do da, 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 da. And she's usually like, slow down, slow down. <laughs> but um, we, it is, we get to get excited many times over than what we used to, because it is fun not only to watch when you bring your own employees and they become even more, but watching your yeah, clients do yeah. the same exact mm-hmm. thing. And as somebody that talks about finance a lot, I don't want to be guilty of coming off. Like I'm talking about capping what you're paying your people, or at least capping the career advancement path. You need to responsibly manage your labor costs. But that's not the same thing as um, talking about the career trajectory. It could be that for this specific role, 50K is the cap. Business model doesn't work to pay more than that. But we would like to have that person getting paid 50K to have a path to switch roles, jobs, grow, get into management, and eventually be a six-figure earner. That's really exciting. So I just, I should say that emphatically, design a business that will allow you to pay your people really, really well. Take ownership for crafting that business. (laughs) I just broke the fourth wall there. (laughs) Can I do that? (laughs) I need to tell you something. Um, Like a Deadpool type thing. You know? <laughs> I love it. So um, you guys are going to be here at the NARPM event here, Texas style. Um, obviously, not everybody listening is going to be there for that. For those that want to get in touch and learn more, what's the best place for them to get in touch? Um, easiest place is just go to our website, rentbridgegroup.com, or feel free to reach out to either one of us. I'm H Park at rentbridgegroup.com, and he's Michael at rentbridgegroup.com. We do video calls. We don't answer the phone. So we don't have phones. <laughs> we do everything via video conference. <laughs> hey, this has been great. Thanks for coming in, guys. All right, Thank thanks you. a lot. All right, talk soon.